making a life worth living and retirement with having is practically about the people in our lives and the product performance or the productivity in which we live. When we produce something important in the world, someone always wants to take it from us. That is sort of what I've learned in my life in the last few years. That when I had a private place and a private classroom, I was totally safe from the men and women who lie, steal, and cheat a person out of their life. When I lost my opportunities with people because I sort of lost hope a little bit based on the loss of people in my life who are rather significant to my life, people in my birth family did not do anything to help me to recover or to remain whole. That is sort of true. I have an eldest sister who was sort of loving and we would still have dinners together sometimes and make meals together. But openly in the last three years, I have suffered greatly at the hands of birth siblings and my mother. You see, when I talk about this honestly, I'm reminding us of many stories in the Bible where rage and rape occurred within families. When I'm talking about rage, I'm talking about people vilely lying to themselves about what they are and aren't doing to monkey in a person's life. When I talk about rape, I'm talking about a variety of hazings activities that people produce in their minds or in their hearts and their souls that remove a person's rights in the land. You see, many people think they have rights in other people's lives. If a man is walking down the street and a mom and a child happen to drive by, they stare at him. They don't wave. They don't say hello. They don't acknowledge he might be a local neighbor. They don't acknowledge he might be just trekking to prepare for a travel exotic trip or something like that getting his body into some endurance, carrying a pack because he'll have to carry one when he travels, and they don't really think about that quickly. That mom doesn't say, now, where do you think that man is going, traveling to? What do you think his life journey is about? And how do you think the Lord is leading him in his life? I rarely hear that. What I usually get is a mom is concerned about a man who looks like me walking through a neighborhood, as if someone like me is going to run out into the middle of the street stop her little car and say something inappropriate. You know, that just gets old, frankly. It's judgment in the wrong way. You see, when people produce hatred in their souls, they're open to the satanic force. That satanic force allows them to believe they have rights to do all sorts of things, including lying to themselves about what they are or not allowing in their home. When a person communicates that theft is going on in a home, they really should be listening. If they're not listening, it usually means that they're a part of that theft, hazing, and harassment. Especially if, after repeated attempts, they stick with their original story, that that's not possible, that's illogical, there's a mental instability here, and all the things that they put out there to try to protect their lives from the lies they tell. You see, in reality, people work in teams, they work in strategy, they try to one up some person and they literally destroy life for themselves. You see, in the book of Mark, in the Bible, it talks a lot about our rights in the Lord. It talks a lot about our opportunities to produce a life for ourselves that's full of magic. There's a wonderful passage in Mark 11:23 through 24. Amazingly, there's a lie number in that, but I won't give it all away. There's also a wonderful heaven number in that about perfection, but only my teacher of numerics would recognize those things is not true. Any student who produced herself or himself in that classroom would know these things. That Christian minister in a metaphysical shop knows about numbers and how the Lord utilizes them in our lives. But the passage is, For assuredly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever it says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Long ago I prayed three years straight, maybe four, intermittently in the fourth, for one thing to happen for my life, that I would receive the love of a lifetime from someone I adored. It's been a long haul, and I haven't been as prayerful about it, and I've been a little bit sad about the loss of that relationship. It took a great toll on my life and nearly took my life in a forlorn moment when I said to the Lord, Please, Lord, just take me home. 
I can't bear life without that girl in my life. You see, the soul's code is what we fall in love with. The soul of another human being, the perception of how we feel when we're with them, and how I certainly felt that she had come into my life based on a previous prayer I had made. I won't talk about that previous prayer because that's private between me and God. I can only say that very shortly after that profound prayer, deep in my soul, probably on my knees, when I was looking for answers in my life, she entered into it. You see, sometimes people enter into a life for a short period of time, they go on to their other activities in life, they produce a drama that requires them to be taken away, or they continue to produce drama in their life because of the adrenaline rush it gives them, or the relationship extension that is really no longer healthy for them. What I've observed by doing my own research to find out whether something said to me via text message was true or not is that that little person that I sort of cared for has remained in legal litigation with the person she should have let go of a long time ago. It might be him trying to destroy her rights in life, to be happy, to go on to prosperity, or just parents failing to recognize that children need closure of one door or another. They can't always hang on to both parents is somewhat truth. Literally, sometimes the hanging on to a parent in a child's mind creates problems for the child going forward and producing a healthy lifestyle and lifelong partner in the future for themselves. I have recognized that in my own stepson, that while he returned to Japan to really see his birth father, within a short period of time, he was no longer interested in that man. It could be sort of my fault because I wasn't always the most positive about his birth father, but I did really struggle and try to always say positive things about how I'm pretty sure his father still loved him in some way. It wasn't my right to say any more because of how the relationship went, but openly what I told him was, if he truly needed to meet his father again as an adult, that was his right to do. What I learned from his mom was in a few short weeks or months, he was ready to get rid of his father in his life. My guess is that the problems and codependencies that man had in that foreign country proved themselves, and the illicit behavior of men that's allowed by society also may have impacted my son's life in some way, in a personal way. And that sort of made me sad, but I was hopeful he'd find himself in that moment. My prayer is that he recognizes me as his American father, who loves him with all his heart. Moments of time we have to say those things are often fleeting. Moments of time we have to talk to people we care for are often sad. And in truth, some monster deleted my son's phone number from my phone book. No one had the right to do that, but people who play on technology in coffee houses, who have technological skills, and people who stalk a person's life or interfere with a person's rights often do monstrous things like that. I would like him to call me, but so many people have messed with my phone systems that I doubt he would really get through. When we talk about the passage from Mark, we recognize the power and the magic of the Lord on high, that when it's the appropriate time in life for things to be revealed, it happens. When it's the appropriate time to learn who our real family is, we may only discover that the real parent of our life is Lord Jesus and the Father and Mother God, who sit above him in heaven. You see, the Trinity is often something spoken about in Christian circles, but rarely is it really talked about on a regular basis from the pulpit by pastors who profess to have gone to seminary and literally say they understand the word. Many pastors simply strictly preach right from the Bible. They take their entire church organization through a Bible study to require them to know passages and verses and then talk a little bit about the times that those things were there. Other pastors use their verses in the Bible to talk about life today or to give stories about people on life's journey and path towards heaven, which is usually what everyone is on. You see, in truth, we are all here on this planet for a short period of time. How long that is, is often professed by how loving we can be to other people sometimes and how careful we are with our own health care and our own love of other people and what we do to them in the living moments of our life. In our life, we need lots of people is not true. 
but we do need a significant number to produce a life worth living in retirement with having. People in telecommunications sort of recognize that technology does have a limit, and the pocketing of minutes in our phones, in our computers, in our emails, and other things have a cost, literally, to their usage. When we pay for the telephone services, we are literally paying for not only, I guess, the right to have that phone, because I don't really know why there's a charge for electricity if it's naturally occurring, but openly for the people who service the entire world or the entire globe, or at least the nation or a state or a local community who provide us that capabilities of talking by a federally protected phone line. The FCC and Federal Trade Commission, I believe, regulate telephone services and openly our text messages are often read or seen by a computer. If certain keywords are put within a text message, it might give rise to someone as a person starting to pay attention to literally what's been said. Hateful things are most certainly recognized, evil thoughts are most cert definitely looked over, and anything on anything inscrupulous is most likely put into a file somewhere, almost like the X-Files in the FBI. But openly, I can't say that for sure because I'm not one of those people. I just know that there is always a cost to every service provided, and the cost of free is sometimes the right to our own privacy, the right to our own capabilities, and often the right to our own messages. In life, we have moments of time to help someone to move forward in life or destroy their life with a lie we put in their record based on our feelings about how someone experienced us as a professional service provider. In moments of time, when we produce a lie that produces harm to another human's life, it usually means our life will suffer. What I mean by that is kind of straightforward. If I give the example of my own late father, I could say that in our youth, he was not the most loving all the time. He was a disciplinarian, and sometimes that discipline went to the extreme. I can say that, having watched my mother be pounded into the corner by my father. She was good with makeup, and so he was also careful never to hit her face, but I'm pretty sure she had bruise marks by the way he pounded her. She may not recall those stories because late in life, my father learned to love. He might have received the Lord a little better, and openly he stopped his alcoholism, which literally led to fights all the time. As a teenager, I came to know how many drinks my parents had had when I would walk in the door from sports activities. I could tell by the tone, by the nature of the relationship, and just by the air in the room where they were in their drinking festivities of being what my father and mother liked to call social drinkers. The problem with social drinkers is they were having really hard liquor in those moments of time. The Manhattan was the standard drink of my family, and openly if I share this story and embarrass my mother, I'm sorry, but in life we all have a story to tell, and this is my story, not hers. What I can say is late in life my father's health took a turn. He received an illness from the Lord to help take him to heaven. That illness took seven or eight years to transpire across his body and eventually to his feeble mind. But in truth, he was pretty with it during the hours in which I was with him mentally. He always loved having breakfast with me, but there was always some monster in his community who worked in the kitchen, who ran the office there, who thought they should make fun of the fact that that my father loved having his son eat breakfast with him on a daily basis. It was a part of the free opportunity of being a resident there, and just because other residents didn't have children who did it as regular as me, didn't mean that a man couldn't have simply said to my father, there's a little extra expense occurring here, would you mind paying a little extra in your food bill to cover this breakfast with your son? My father would have willingly paid it with no problem and felt just fine about that regardful and respectful conversation. Instead, that monster made an issue for my family. My family eventually moved from that residence community, which was near Keystone at the crossing, but openly the reason I share it is because when we're late in our years, we often go from independent living to something a little bit more helpful, a little bit more required, and those are called assistant living centers. If our mind is no longer able to do things, we may no longer drive after a point if we're losing our eyesight, it might be because the Lord is not pleased with how we are seeing things in life. 
My mother is experiencing some eyesight loss, and I know in the last year or so, I have significantly lost some eyesight. I also know some things that I've said to the Lord, which may have produced some of my recent inability to see, but I'm also at the point in my life where it's natural to lose a little eyesight. The gal I love also seems to need some help with her eyesight because I've seen her in glasses and she looks absolutely stunning. But that's just my feeling about what I see. You see, I see love in the world is true, but I don't see love for my birth family regularly. They don't like the lectures I give them on their life because it's not really my right to say how they spend their money. But when they vilely pay for things that they have multiples of instead of providing healthy food for other people who are homeless or people in their own churches, it sort of bothers me. It really sort of makes me feel like they've missed the message of the Bible. When I see siblings paying for sheep, goats, dogs, chicken, cats, mice for all I know, and things like that, and hens and roosters that produce eggs, but they don't share those things with their family who are literally starving, I have to wonder what Lord they re regard. In my life, when I talk about the Bible, I usually don't cite the passages because I don't necessarily have a mind for it, but I don't have the office like I used to that would allow me to access my resources. What I know is that my grandmother left me some books, and I'm glad for that. But what I also know is many of my own artifacts from my own life have been pilfered from my storage locker illegally and immorally so. The man and woman who run the place have lied to my parents about their, or my parentage, meaning my mother, about the fact that there's a new manager in the place. I don't believe so. It's a little odd for someone to literally leave a place that quickly after moving in, but it's also odd for the man in charge to look pretty much identical to the man I met long ago. He simply is wearing more mature clothes now. You see, in life, when you steal from others, you can sell those things, and it produces a different lifestyle and a different look at life. But openly, when I talk about this, where are the police officers and the federal agents going in and researching theft? I haven't heard anything about it, and I don't talk to police because the last time I talked about theft to a police officer, she said, you have to prove it, you have to catch it. And when I talked to the sheriff, that's pretty much what they told me. What that means is we either have to be anal or attentive about writing every possession down and taking a photograph of everything, but the problem is a thief can monkey around in our computers and delete our files. As I've recently discovered, someone totally deleted all my Japanese language files, probably because they arrogantly thought I had another copy. I didn't because the files were so large, they couldn't be put on a regular thumb drive. And that's the truth. Openly may be a time for me to stop my language instruction, but no one had the lawful right to monkey with my files. That vile attack on my life is something that a sibling will lie about. They will never admit that they didn't know what they were doing in that moment of time, and they most certainly are unlikely to admit to filing a and, and conducting a cybercrime on someone they were trying to haze and tell they had no more rights to those documents. You see, in life, we always have an older sibling who's trying to teach us a lesson. The problem they have to look into is whether or not that lesson is moralistically one thing that the Lord has asked them in some true fashion of hearing the Lord's voice command them to do that. Some people talk about how God pretends to talk to them, meaning they'll say, I just felt the Lord was telling me this. Really? Did you actually hear his voice? Did you hear an angel talk to you? Did you check with any type of force-oriented uh, faith fob like I sell? Or are you just allowing your children, your teenagers, to illegally walk into someone's house through an open window or by unlocking the front door with a key that they procured through their theft? Or is it a neighbor you've trusted with your key and then lied about them still having it who's protecting himself by lying and saying he doesn't have the key anymore? There's always someone who can lie. There's always someone who can produce a lie. The only question is, what are people lying about? Are they lying about their rights in people's lives? Are they lying about their theft of other people's property? Are they lying about the stealing of a person's federally protected banking records, tax records, or visual arts capabilities? A lot of my marketing materials have gone completely deleted from three different gig drives. None of it was the same content. It was all different. It was all multiples. It was all video. It was a lot of things that were larger than files that can be placed on a thumb drive in any fashion or form. I had the lawful right to purchase those items. I have another drive that I can't find at all. It was literally put in my storage locker 
and I wasn't able to use it because someone locked me out of it. It was a $50 purchase. So I really had four drives destroyed. I also had a computer in my house that was locked on me by someone. I couldn't put files on it or take files off it. I had another small computer I purchased actually as a gift for my mother because she was wanting to have something portable and someone monkeyed around with that computer too. You see, in life we have moments of time to prove who we are technologically, but if you're illegally getting onto someone else's property, you should actually go to jail. It's not a hate crime necessarily, but it is a hate crime. It's literally saying, I feel power to come into your house, violate your property, destroy your rights to it, and literally remove it from you completely. That is a hateful act. It's not godly, and it's certainly pretty satanic. And openly, if I talk about Satan, I'm talking about the reality of people's lies. When people lie about monkeying around in people's property and taking pouches that are not theirs to try and produce a life that's not really theirs and lying about their skills and lying about what they've created and lying, lying, lying all day long, it gets old. People lie to themselves about their rights in the world. They lie to themselves about their right to purchase things too. The Lord produces for us our income levels is somewhat truth. But a homeless person is not necessarily homeless by choice. A homeless person might become homeless because of lies put on their name. It could be a homeless situation because they lost companies or they lost clients or they lost the job. I seen a man in the store who was clearly at a loss of what to purchase food-wise. He was milling about and seemed to not be in himself while he was doing it. I simply turned to him based on the Lord's prompting to say, the loss will get better in time. My impression of him was he was a widower who just lost his spouse. That was my feeling about him. I could have been totally wrong. He might have just lost the job, but he clearly was at a loss in that store. Most men go in, pick up what they need, throw it in their cart, and go on. They don't stand forever looking over different types of packets, not sure what to buy or what to make, and if his wife did all the cooking, he probably doesn't even know how to boil water anymore, or he just isn't sure what his body needs at this time during his loss. You see, people are really great during the first week of someone's funeral to show up with food and stuff, but it takes a real good program to recognize that loss is something that is long-term, it's hard to deal with, and even in divorce care, they don't provide enough help. They literally don't provide enough education about this time in life is for you to figure out who you really are and be alone for a while. Not rush into any new relationship, not take on any new tactile opportunities in physicalities with others, but literally focus on your own spirituality, your own self, your own care of your children, and making sure they feel loved during this tough time. It's a hard thing to do, but practically we do it. Now, when I talk about this, I'm talking about real life, I'm talking about real loss, I'm talking about real love, I'm talking about how you prove your love to others. You don't prove your love to others by constantly threatening them with police calls, incident reports, medications, mental health harassment, and literally everything else under the sun that is a vile act that is not anything representing Jesus in anyone's life but your own. You see, you look like a warlord in that moment of time. You look foolish to anybody watching, and publicly you might have embarrassed your own self because you didn't hear someone say, stop. You see, sometimes danger lurks around the corner, and if you don't listen because you're so arrogant and feeling that you should be able to walk anywhere you like, you might just fall your ass into a sinkhole. I've seen a sinkhole in the ground the other day I was walking. I peered down and saw it was a huge hole. A child could fall in, a young boy could be curious, anything could happen in that place. I've also discovered by being tested a little bit about God, about going through fields, how difficult it can be if the mud has a suction to it. Your shoes get all muddied up and you literally could be sucked into the point where you can't move at all. Trying to take your shoes off to get out of it might just make things worse and you get mud up your legs, all up your pants, and you could get stuck even worse. And someone might not ever find you. We have a lot of places that have sidewalks that begin, but then there's no ending. We have a lot of lakes that form and freeze over ground, but they literally could break and you could get stuck in the mud that might still be damp underneath. You see, there's a lot of risks in life. I also was taken on a walk by the Lord this last day in order to see some of the places I had transgressed when my sister literally threw me out of her car in the freezing cold 
during the snowy day of the winter, when it was truly cold. I had very little with me is sort of true. I had enough to carry is absolute true, and openly, somehow, I made it across the lake with my belongings. I don't remember what bags I had with me. I might have left some things at home because God prompted me to. Knowing what each person is going to do in life is an amazing thing. It's called an Ashkagic record in the metaphysical community, and I don't know what Ashkagic means in truth, but my understanding is it's the book of life for your life. There is a reader in one of the metaphysical shops, or pretends to be a reader. Literally, I can't tell if this dude is really able to do anything or not. I didn't really experience a great reading from him, but God said, go ahead, get one from him. So I did, just to hear what it was like. But he literally was a, a poor guy is not true. My point is, he was basically pretending as though he was opening the record of my life and telling me how my life would go. I don't really buy the record because he told me my life would go on to fancy free educational opportunities and all sorts of things, and that didn't really happen. I also know that practically since I've talked online about my business, which I've never done before, those documents got deleted from my hard drives. And openly, someone illegally took my hard drives out of my car and put them into their squad car. And it could have been that female officer doing it along with the, all the other things that got pilfered when my stuff was an impound. My trail camera went missing. My pocket knife that was silver went missing. My fork and knife for camping that I purchased at a Meyer store went missing. And all sorts of other things went rearranged completely. The truth is my vehicle was not participating in any type of crime. So the fact that someone got into my car and rearranged everything actually showed the illegal activity of that impound and the police force that got into it. I absolutely know this is factual because I had a photograph in my underpants, which has a pocket for putting money and other things in when you don't have pants on with pockets like sweatpants and things like that. And what ended up happening was that photograph that was a two by three or smaller has went completely missing. I also found that one layer of my clothing was put back in my vehicle. That was fortunate because it was my clothing, but it wasn't right that someone literally went onto that grounds and put that in the car or literally found my car before it went to impound. It doesn't really matter. It was still an illegal act. And openly, I was lucky to find as much as I found in the car, but someone still has violated my rights here and there and everywhere. I had a lot of special things on my person, in my pockets for gifts for the upcoming Christmas season, and all of that was stolen from me. Angel coins and other things that I had, unique photographs, and I found things from my storage unit that I had in a religious box coming into my pockets here in my sister's home and into my Christian pouch that I carry with all sorts of cards. The other evening in my sister's home, I put a special card in my briefcase that I had found someplace else in my storage unit. And when I went to find that card, as the Lord prompted me to either put it in the briefcase and then come and find it, I found it was missing, which literally meant that someone has lied about their rights in my property, and for all I know, it could already be March. You see, people who monkey with the mind literally think they can play games like this in people's lives and lie about what day it is, what time it is, ruin a computer to have the wrong date and time, and literally monkey a person out of a life. I know I've been interfered with in every law firm that I've called, and openly I know I've been called for information to be solicited. I also know there was a military woman who interrogated me, and she probably was a plant entirely that the Lord wanted me to talk to. But I don't know why God would put me in that position other than to sort of show her that she is a liar of the land. You see, liars of the land steal information and then use that information to harm people. Liars of the land steal property and take it away. I had a black pouch in my bag that had important letters in it. Those have gone completely missing from my property. I didn't give anyone the right to take those things, but they're gone now. And they were in my sister's home. You see, the liar who keeps coming in and out of my sister's home has taken photographs that I put in a pouch, has taken metaphysical things that I have saved for myself, and openly other property. I'll probably find handkerchiefs gone messed, but next, but if I say that, they will go missing. You see, there are people who like to play out this idea of you're producing a life. I had a metaphysical teacher who said that all the time, but I wouldn't. it wouldn't surprise me if my siblings got in touch with her and just told her she could take whatever the hell she wanted to now because they weren't going to allow me to produce anything in life. I don't believe my sisters have any interest in me producing a healthy, 
Happy, healthy life is absolute truth. There's nothing they can do at this moment in time to prove that to me other than either leave me alone or pay me money. And that's the bottom line a man feels. My brother is not going to be in my life, and when I see him, I feel ill. Physically ill that he would involve himself, his wife, and his children in a lie on my life and my name. But practically, that is my right to opinion. It is my right to experience, not at all, because I didn't ask for his help, is absolute truth. I don't trust him. I don't like him. I think he's a horrible technician on computers. Most of the computers he built for me, and even the ones I paid for, did not work correctly. There was always a problem. Someone is always monkeying around in technology. My sister was saying, hey, this is a really interesting radio program about cybercrime. And literally, what I heard the people saying was that you can't stop cybercrime. I don't agree. What I feel is that we are not talking enough to children and teenagers about the laws of the land and people's rights. And I feel that most importantly, we need a president in the White House who knows the law. Who, regrets, who regards constitutional law, who understands international human rights declarations to the point of applying it to every American citizen in the land. You see, people sort of forget we're a world power. They get into their daily life. They forget we're an international nation. They forget we have wars going on elsewhere. And we allow war happening in families and in communities and in neighborhoods produced by people who hate on other people's lives. They produce hatred in their souls, they take actions that are illegal, and they destroy a life in their lies to themselves and to their others that they harm. They literally think they're somehow in God's house, and I promise you, they're not. They might just lose their house to a sheriff's sale or something else if they don't stop their harassment. For those that are rent a home, they could lose their rental, and then where will they be? They'll be stuck with having to move a lot of stuff, that they no longer use because they didn't downsize enough to the simplest of things. In life, we have moments of time to travel, and I've traveled a bit of the Midwest and found lovely places to go, people to meet, and wonderful food with the God's help. My faith, Bob, and my love of God, Lord Jesus and all, has produced that for my life. My siblings hated me traveling, I guess. My mother made a comment once of they couldn't catch me. It wasn't their right to catch me. She doesn't catch my brother. She doesn't catch my sisters. She doesn't do anything like that. But to her youngest child, she lies and steals his property. She held it hostage in her apartment complex. For a long time, she made it impossible for me to visit. And openly, she does it willingly so. So why should I believe for one second that my mother loves me at all? You see, that's why my faith is in the Lord. That's why I love God in heaven as my father. And I know there's a mother figure as well up there who watches out for me. It's very difficult to be a reader of sorts, a person with gifts of the spirit now and gifts of the soul. It's also very exhausting to channel a lot, and openly I believe it has an impact on the mind. But in truth, if the Lord wants to speak through you or someone else, how do you prove that they speak through you? I've given readings that everybody loved, that made people cry, they couldn't believe how accurate they were. Then the next minute they told that reading story, that private information to others and discover that that person will give them opinion, render an observation, and then a few minutes later they feel ill about the reading they've received. You see, sometimes in life pastors should not be pastors. Other times in life people who are not pastors should become pastors. And openly there's always a time to finish a cast. Thanks for listening. Blake Henson, Blaze Communications, LLC. I appreciate those who stick with me through this authentic, transparent,